Storytelling is always king. That's all that matters to us. And I want to be true to those stories. I want to be true to you guys and really give you something different than you've ever seen before. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. So James Gunn is about to reboot the DCU and end the Snyderverse for good, but what does that actually mean? In this video, we're gonna dive very deep into these filmmakers, examine what makes them tick, and find out what actually separates these two very different approaches to DC's cinematic universe. First, let's talk about James Gunn. Gunn's characters embrace the lighthearted nature of comics while still maintaining some sense of realism. This creates relatable characters who are easy to fall in love with, no matter how flawed, which fit perfectly with the MCU. Snyder, on the other hand, made a point of differentiating himself from the MCU. While the MCU stories centered mostly around humans becoming gods, Snyder's films were about gods becoming human. From the little we know of and have seen, we can already tell that Gunn's universe is set to be vastly different than the Snyderverse, which may be precisely what the reboot needs. Please. I really need this. Hey, how'd your hair get so short? In some shots, my hair is shorter. So let's talk about these two filmmakers, their careers, and how we got here. Er, James Gunn versus Max Snyder. Exactly. In a cage death match. Die, millionaires, die. That's enough, comrade. So as we said earlier, Snyder tried to differentiate his films from the MCU by telling stories about gods becoming humans versus the other way around, which isn't a new concept in DC Comics. In fact, the idea was actually best summarized in Kill Bill Volume 2. Clark Kent is how Superman views us. He's weak. He's unsure of himself. He's a coward. Now, while Clark Kent took a backseat in most of Snyder's stories, Cavill's version of Superman was more than just an average citizen who stumbled into great power and thus was burdened by great responsibility. With great power comes Don't great- Don't you dare finish that sentence. Don't do it. This Superman is a messianic figure who stayed hidden until humanity truly needed him, despite feeling detached from the human race. This was the concept explored in Man of Steel. I thought you hated that movie. Well, personally, I didn't like Snyder's take on this character, but it was a well-made movie. Just for me, wasn't a great Superman film. But I can conceptually understand why Snyderverse fans like this version of Superman. Cavill's Superman was an outsider, someone burdened by their own strength and even shunned at an early age for helping people. That, plus killing Zod in the end, was a major departure from the big blue Boy Scout that we typically think of in Superman films. Although I want to remind you that Richard Donner's Superman 78 dealt with a lot of these same themes. We had young Clark feeling like an outsider, searching for his place in the world, and even traveling to the Arctic to find a Kryptonian haven where he could learn who he truly was. So Snyder's take was filled with controversial decisions on a loved character, but it set the foundation for the Snyder universe. That's not a foundation on which friendships are based. The Snyderverse dealt with intense emotional themes, and each chapter had consequences that seemingly threatened the entire world, threats that would have otherwise required the Avengers in the MCU. Since Snyder's stories were exclusively told through Superman, the aspect of gods becoming men became the Snyderverse's driving theme, and that's a lot harder for an audience to relate to. I'm not a god. It's much easier to relate to Spider-Man since he constantly fails in some of the most human ways, but it's kind of hard to relate to Superman. Like, none of you watching this video have ever had a genetic codex for an entire species imbued in your DNA. It's hard to relate to the guy who literally stares at Earth from space. So this idea of gods becoming men is also the most DC aspect of the films. What do you mean by the most DC? Well, you could argue that the idea of gods becoming men is actually the thing that distinguishes DC from Marvel in general. Take characters like The Flash and Quicksilver. Both are speedsters with similar powers on paper, but Barry can literally turn back time and is an actual conduit for the Speed Force, which gives him godlike powers. Superman, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman, all of them have nearly limitless powers, whereas Marvel characters tend to have more humanizing limitations. Like as awesome as Spider-Man is, he'd have a hard time web-slinging through the middle of Nebraska. But actually what defines Spider-Man isn't the limitations of his powers, it's the limitations of his humanity. He's still a regular guy who struggles with his love life, struggles to pay rent. Rent? Or what about Thor or Batman? They are the exceptions to this rule. Well, obviously, yeah, there's exceptions, but even those examples you cited still bear emblematic traits of their perspective universes. Thor may have been a god, but he was probably the most relatable god we've seen on screen. In the comics, and in the first Thor movie, the Thunder God is stripped of his powers to learn humility as a normal man living in Midgard, and the MCU has gradually turned Thor into a big earthling goofball. I'm gonna fly over to your house, come down to that basement you're hiding in, rip off your arms, and shove them up your butt. Batman may not be a god, but he certainly has a god complex. He's the only man who's cocky enough to take on a literal god himself. Plus, his near-endless resources make him kind of godlike. I mean, Batman's supposed to be like Odysseus, a man skilled in all means of contending, but over the years, he's evolved into a character who's always so totally in control of every situation, he might as well be godlike. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. 
Additionally, to Snyder's credit, his Batman is more of a side character. He's the human challenger to the gods. And in Batman v Superman, Bruce's character arc is very straightforward. He's there to recognize the humanity inside of Superman. Kill Martha! And then in the Justice League, he has a one-note character arc to unite the Justice League. Haven't you heard? We're getting the band back together. In Snyder's full vision, Batman's also a prophet. He was the only hero that was constantly plagued by visions of Darkseid's apocalyptic future, and he's the only Justice League member that's visited by Barry in that one scene that Snyder fans won't let go of. So even though he's just a man, he still fits a lot of these same godlike characteristics. This man is my god. <laughs> Now, with that said, none of that really helped the character in these movies. Batfleck had some kick-ass moments, but he never really landed with general audiences. So it's possible that Snyder's tunnel vision approach to this one particular aspect of DC really cost the Dark Knight a lot. You know how much I sacrificed? Now, we did a video a couple years back where we dove into Snyder's background to ask why he seems to be pursuing these same themes in all of his movies. In works like 300, Watchmen, and the DCEU, he's always telling stories about these godlike heroes painted on these beautiful tapestries. And when you explore his upbringing and favorite media, we can see where this point of view evolved from. His mother was a painter, so from a young age, Snyder learned to appreciate the beauty of a frozen image. So you're like, can I see this scene before we make it? And he has beautiful drawings. His favorite book as a child was called Jonathan Livingston Seagull, a story about a seagull who is punished by his father for wanting to fly higher than the other birds. Similar to how Snyder's Superman is persecuted by the world for his powers, and even his dad tries to limit his godhood. Well, Clark, you have to keep this side of yourself a secret. Snyder was also raised a Christian scientist. Now, this is a sect of Christianity that believes that the physical world is not real, or at least that it's a shadow of the true heavenly existence. Luminous beings don't eat, not this crude matter. To quote Snyder, Christian scientists believe that part of our journey is to transcend that reality through Christ-like living. I hear that, and I think of Dr. Manhattan, a man who literally transcended this world to become a god. So Snyder's point of view of these heroes and his desaturated look became so dominant that most fans started to look at the DC as just a darker, less funny version of Marvel. But DC can be goofy. Like, let's not forget that DC is still the home of Batman shark repellent, a sentient street, and characters like Matter Eater Lad. Listen, say I had a team up with Matter Eater Lad, my sense of what's known as up. In fact, I'd argue that at its core, DC is way goofier than Marvel, and maybe its film should be goofier too. It would be incredibly hard to fit characters like Plastic Man into Snyder's dark, gritty, slow motion think pieces. Do you bleed? Oh, come on! No finder's feet? <laughs> So if DC wants to bring their full roster of characters into the DCU eventually, it's gonna get goofy. You wanna get nuts? Let's get nuts. So while Snyder's vision may have been intriguing, it's not necessarily the best fit for the franchise as it's written on the page, which brings us to James Gunn. Now to understand James Gunn's approach, first let's do a quick accounting of where DC is right now. After the flop of The Flash and Shazam and Black Adam and like a bunch of other movies before that, it feels like things have gone completely off the rails at Warner Brothers and fans are starting to lose faith that we will ever see a DC universe that rivals the MCU. And and it was very ambiguous leading up to The Flash. We weren't sure if we were getting like a whole new rebooted universe or if like Ezra Miller was gonna be The Flash in the DCU that Gunn was creating. It was kept intentionally vague. So The Flash's reception kinda gave the DCU a false start, but that has not slowed Gunn's momentum at all. He recently announced that his Superman is David Corrin Sweat, a relatively new face to Hollywood, alongside marvelous Mrs. Maisel herself, Rachel Brosnahan as Lois Lane. He's announced a slew of other heroes, including Hawkwoman, Metamorpho, Guy Gardner, that will appear in the movie. Well, how can you expect us to get excited about that when, when, you know, Flash was so bad. Didn't he say that he liked that movie? A fantastic movie that I really love. It's so good. Yeah, but look, honestly, I think he was just being a good soldier. The language is kept ambiguous about whether or not the post-Flash world would be his DCU or not. It turns out that Flash was just created a big multiverse for Gunn's movies to exist within. Now, it makes sense for Gunn to not trash existing DC movies. After all, there's still one DC movie yet to come out that isn't part of his universe, Aquaman, and he wants to keep fans invested in DC films. Stay with me, stay with me. Stay with me, stay with me. Gunn has had amazing success with D-list characters. The Guardians of the Galaxy were unheard of before Gunn and Nicole Perlman brought them to the big screen. And that success has only snowballed after the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker. Dude, I didn't mean to put your father in prison. Then why'd you put him there? Because I couldn't think of anybody else. What about Ariana Grande or Drake? What? Seriously, the dude has not missed when it comes to superhero films. His movies are still firmly grounded in reality, but they also embrace the fantastical. I seriously doubt that Starro, a giant kaiju starfish was ever in the plans for the Snyderverse, but it was the first villain out the gate from James Gunn because it's inherently more James Gunn. Oh, what do you mean? Like there's a lot of bad words and jokes about human private parts and, and human jail all the time? No. You want us to read the manual for you too, bro? 
Now what? Open the f***ing door. Fran Tarkenton, Joe Montana, Joe Montana. What the and well, yeah, James Gunn does that a lot. But James Gunn's movies, going all the way back to the Scooby-Doo films he wrote, are all about the importance of family and acceptance. Rather than focusing on gods becoming human, he likes stories about deeply flawed humans who are sometimes grappling with superhuman abilities. In Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Peter Quill is given the powers of a god. You are a god! But he throws away that power to save his extended family. The ultimate lesson of that movie is that he learns to appreciate his found family. He may have been your father, boy. But he wasn't your daddy. I'm very poppin', y'all! Guardians 3 takes this even further by focusing on Rocket. Rocket believes that he is a monster, unlovable. As if you were cobbled together by fat-fingered children. How could you be part of a perfect species? And after he caused the deaths of his friends, he believes that he is unworthy of love. The Guardians films all take the characters on an arc where they learn to appreciate each other as people and not as objects. Empathy is the driving theme of all three movies. As Rocket finally learns to love himself, he can accept the love of others. The Suicide Squad is about people who are also irredeemable, who exist at the fringes of society. These are people that the system has decreed have no place in decent society, which is why Taika Waititi seems as Ratcatcher 1 hits so hard. Rats are the lowliest and most despised of all creatures, my love. If they have purpose, so do we all. So this is the point of view that James Gunn sees the world through. Unlike Snyder, he approaches all of his characters through a fundamentally human lens. So let's apply that to the new DCU. We know that his Superman Legacy series will be based on All-Star Superman, which is a pretty unique pick. It is an excellent choice. Not only is Kal-El's identity as Clark Kent a more prominent aspect of the story, but the approach to Superman is much more Human. All-Star Superman is an incredible comic book where Kal-El knows that he's dying and he spends his last days like making right certain wrongs. That old question, what would you do if you had a month to live? This comic book answer is what would Superman do with a month to live? And it cuts to the very core of who Superman is. During an interview, the writer of the All-Star Superman series, Grant Morrison, talked about his approach to the character, opting for a much more relaxed Superman. In an interview with Newsarama, Morrison described him as laid back and unintense, saying, Superman wouldn't puff out his chest or posture heroically. He would be totally chilled. If nothing can hurt you, you can afford to be cool. Which is already very different from Henry Cavill Superman. Yeah, Henry Cavill Superman seemed to constantly carry around the burden of having to do good, whereas All-Star Superman enjoys doing good. Now beyond that, we know the movie's going to feature Lex Luthor, Lois Lane, but we also have some characters we've yet to see on the big screen, such as Crypto the Super Dog. I'll have you know he very much already made his debut in The Super Pets, which was a fantastic movie, highly underrated, and criminally undercovered by this channel. Yeah, it was truly an unsung masterpiece, but see, the inclusion of elements like Crypto in this movie, who's a literal superpowered dog, plus the small samples of work that we've seen, already suggest a major tonal shift from what we've seen in the past. And it resonated with fans. People genuinely love Peacemaker, despite the fact that it seemed like the most extra thing ever. Why do we need to know more about Peacemaker after seeing him die in the Suicide Squad? But in the end, we're glad that we got the show. It was hilarious and absolutely fleshed out the character and the DC world just a little bit more. Peacemaker is another one of Gunn's flawed figures with a haunted past, who finds redemption through a found family. Family. He ends the series by killing the aliens who would have fixed all the world's problems. To save your people and your world, no matter how many lives it cost us but he did it to protect the people that he cared about. In this ending, we also see another theme in Gunn's work, the idea of rebelling against control. For instance, in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, it's not the Nova Corps who organized everyone and saved the day. It was the Guardians of the Galaxy, a group of escaped fugitives who had to tell the Nova Corps what to do. So Peacemaker is a great example of how Gunn's DC universe can be both funny and goofy while still retaining a grounded approach and dealing with serious issues. So what about the DCU's Batman? Well, Gunn has already announced that the Brave and the Bold will be his take on the Cape Crusader, and it will also feature Damian Wayne as Robin. Who's Damian Wayne? He is the son of Batman and Talia al Ghul, an assassin who works for the League of Shadows. He was raised by them until he met his father and became the first Robin with the katana. The katana, most noble of all the blades. Damian is another character who exists on the fringes of society. He's a murderer, trained to be an assassin. He's somebody who's going to need redemption, and having a dad Batman is another defining feature of Gunn's DCU. It's raining death. This is a Batman who has to deal with his trauma head on in order to set an example for his son. And for Bruce Wayne, there's nothing more difficult than dealing with trauma. Am I blue? So this means that we're not going to get this renegade god hunter from the Snyderverse, but rather a more adult Batman. It's really interesting to 
see the tools that Gunn has chosen to play with in Phase 1 of the DCU. Supergirl, Swamp Thing, and the Authority are all super excited in their own rights. But after Peacemaker, the projects that look truly interesting are the TV series. We know that Amanda Waller is going to hit because Viola Davis. Paradise Lost seems to be a unique take on Wonder Woman's world, and HBO's Lanterns has the potential to finally redeem one of the best comic book characters from that hit and mostly miss Ryan Reynolds' film. Welcome to Ring Slingin' 101, or as I like to call it, the worst day of your worthless life. The first phase or chapter of Gunn's universe is called Gods and Monsters, whereas like Snyder, mostly focused on gods and man. The monsters aspect of this is what intrigues me the most. Swamp Thing is a monster who believes that he's human, learns that he's not, and then embraces a new form of humanity within himself. Supergirl had to watch her planet and family die, so she'll have survivor guilt, kind of similar to Rockets. But even out of all that, one of the announced TV series stands out as the most James Gunn of them all, and that is Booster Gold. Who's that? Who's Booster Girl? He is a time traveler from the future who uses future tech to be a hero in the modern age. He's typically comedy relief and kind of a sellout, which is exactly the kind of character that Gunn would thrive with. Sounds like my kind of guy. Plus, it gives Gunn a conduit to tell a larger story about the universe. The prevention of a future catastrophe? Exactly, which is kind of Booster Gold's whole thing anyways. It's also a perfect example of Gunn's biggest advantage when it comes to creating this new DCU. Cohesion. Gunn loves comic books, and we can see just from the properties that he's chosen to start with that he's already set in the stage for a much bigger story. But wait, Snyder's movies were connected too. Kinda. While Wonder Woman and Aquaman were still very much in the universe Snyder was building, they had very different tones and feels. It's not the same! Then, after Snyder was removed from the Justice League and Whedon stepped in, things really started to go off in their own different directions. There were just too many cooks in the kitchen. You didn't say corner. You didn't say corner. Now, while the MCU has had many directors, they've developed their own way of connecting these stories and giving them a similar look and feel, so that audiences can honestly buy into the idea that these characters all exist in the same universe. This is working. This is working. Now, not only has Gunn been a part of developing that process in the early stages of Phase 1, but he's also been given Feige-like powers to oversee the DCU. Also, if we're being blunt, the Snyderverse movies had script problems. There are so many lines in the Snyderverse films that just fall short. I mean, seriously, remember this? I would advise not getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. Or probably the worst moment of all, this. Save Martha! Now, there were some moments that shined, such as this lasso of the truth seen in The Flash. I developed this all-powerful persona to compensate for my childhood trauma. Or even this. Do you bleed? But those moments are still sandwiched between bad dialogue and over-dramatized plot points. Luckily, the most well-written parts of the DC Universe as it stands now have all come from the horribly beautiful mind of James Gunn. It's also important that Gunn chose a relatively new face for his Superman, since the Snyderverse had its fair share of controversy when it came to its actors. Ezra Miller terrorizing the people in Hawaii definitely had a significant impact on The Flash's box office, which is a pretty bad sign for Aquaman 2 since it will feature Amber Heard as Mira, who was a controversial figure after her very public divorce trial. Even Ben Affleck's cast he was met with strong pushback from fans. And I really like Ben Affleck as Batman. I thought he was great. Gunn picking a new face limits people having big feelings about that face since they don't have much of a portfolio to judge them on. This way, Corn Sweat's Superman performance can be judged simply by how well he brings the character to life and not the previous roles that he's played, as long as they don't get into any trouble. You keep your nose clean, sunshine. Well, I will have my tiny toes crossed for them. But if you want some concrete examples of like, ways I think these universes are going to be different. Let's look at how they handled villains, right? So in Snyder's Justice League, Steppenwolf is, is the main villain, but he's working for Darkseid. And in the Snyder Cut, Darkseid is this huge, untouchable threat. He's so far from everything else. He is godlike. He is Satan. He is the great evil that cannot even be seen, let alone defeated. Whereas, let's look at James Gunn's one DCEU movie, and that's The Suicide Squad. We think that all the way through that, the main villain, Starro the Conqueror, this alien that wants to conquer Earth. But then we find out that the reason Starro wants to conquer Earth is because the people of Earth have abused and tortured him. Just like the anti-heroes at the center of this story, we end up sympathizing with the villain. We see from their point of view. We feel really bad for this giant alien starfish and kind of want him to destroy all the humans. Whereas the Zack Snyder movies lacked any kind of nuance in this way. Zod, super evil Nazi from space who wants to remake the world in his own image. Luther, super evil human who would unleash a devil just to kill a god out of spite. And like I said, Steppenwolf was basically a demon working for the devil. Now maybe in future Justice League films, we would have gotten a little bit more nuance with Superman turning evil and having to be brought back from the dark side, but, you know, we never got there. So, while the Snyderverse was great at delivering the omnibus power behind these DC 
characters, Gunn's universe and his track record shows that his DCU could potentially be a cinematic universe that embodies both the seriousness and goofiness of the DC universe, which honestly, we should all be very excited about. It'll be such an exciting time for you. It really will be. So do you think Gunn's DCU will be better than the Snyderverse? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.